Okay, well, our first speaker today is uh, Robert Digraff from the University of Amsterdam, who's going to tell us about matrix models, topological strings, and supersymmetric gauge theories. Well, <laughs> thank you all for showing up at uh, this time. So, uh, I will be talking about uh, work uh, done in collaboration with Kumrun Waffa, uh, two papers we wrote the last month, and actually uh, I should not only thank the organizers for inviting me to speak, but also to give me kind of this worst slot of the conference, <laughs> because it gave us a full week to uh, think further uh, about these issues, and we had many stimulating uh, conversations, and I think actually the talk would have been very different if I had to give, give it on Monday. So. Actually, it will be based on a lot of previous work, uh, basically all done uh, by Kumrun Vafa and his collaborators. So I'll actually mention many people uh, are actually here also in the audience that contributed to this. So I'm actually surprised to give a talk about matrix models. Uh, the last talk I gave was precisely 11 years ago at Strings 91. And uh, I don't know about uh, solar cycles or something, but I feel I'm living a little bit in the <laughs> cyclic universe. <laughs> So the topic will be matrix models, strings on Calabi-Yaus, and n equals one gate series. And so I will talk about the connection between these three subjects. And perhaps the most exciting one is the connection between matrix models and gate series, which is just a statement entirely in field theory. But the way we arrived at this was a very roundabout way, basically going through closed strings on Calabi-Yaus. So in my presentation, actually the first half of it will be kind of a long way to go, going through various string dualities. But finally, actually, we'll make some kind of rather uh, drastic statements about n equals 1 gate series. So what are the kind of quantities that we're going to compute? <coughs> so we have kind of three fields. So the first is matrix models. That means there's integrals over n by n matrices that we compute in the large n limit. So we, we do a uh, saddle point approximation and in terms of the kind of fat ribbon graphs of the matrix, and we get usually one over n expansion, and so the function fg computes the number of graphs of genus g. Then in closed string theory, of course, we know what fg is, just the string amplitudes all of the same genus. And then finally, in gate theories, we will we be interested in computing in four-dimensional gate theories, kind of d squared theta terms, f terms, kind of holomorphic terms, I'm particularly interested in computing the effect of superpotential of these four-dimensional theories, which will see as data determined by essentially F0, kind of the planar part of what's happening in the other worlds. And of course, also the FGs will play a role here, but they will actually be uh, of interest if you want to compute gravitationally induced terms. Now, you're all fighting your after-banquet hangover. So uh, let me kind of wake you up by making kind of a rather uh, drastic statement. So consider the following system, an n equals 1 pure gate theory with one adjoint field in four dimensions, and include a three-level superpotential W of i. And we want to compute the effect of superpotential, W effective, of S, where S is the Gluino condensate. This effect of superpotential is interesting. Its critical points determine the vacuum structure domain walls of the n equals 1 theory. The claim is the following. This effect of superpotential has the following form. It has a one-loop term, which has the form S log S. There's a simple linear term. And then there's a power series in powers of S. And there can be such a power series because we broke an R symmetry by including this three-level superpotential. And so the claim is that these coefficients that appear in this power series are exactly the planar diagrams of a matrix model. And the matrix model is just, the matri is just kind of the, the gate theory reduced to kind of one point in, sp in space, in superspace. So it's a matrix model, an integral over n by n matrix, with action, the superpotential, the three-level superpotential W of phi. 
So this is kind of the kind of results we will, will be obtaining. So we have an exact expression, and it's completely determined by the planar diagrams. So how did we reach the conclusion? So we're starting now with do, studying strings on Calabi-Yaus. In particular, geometrical transitions. So we have singular Calabi-Yaus that we try to kind of desingularize. And a typical case with some kind of a generalization of the Coney fault, we can to do things, either have a so-called small resolution, where we can blow up the singular points, and you produce lots of spheres, two spheres, which look like holomorphic curves. And there's another way to deform, deform the theory, and that produces basically three spheres, and these three spheres you can think of as kind of corresponding to complex structure moduli. So here we have many holomorphic curves, here we have moduli in the theory. And these, of course, are theories with typically n equals 2 supersymmetry. Now, how do you get a theory with n equals 1? So here's a beautiful duality found by Waffa and also by Klebanov and Strasser, essentially, that if you wrap five brains around these two spheres in the resolved geometry, so you break the symmetry, the supersymmetry, by including brains, then that's dual to including, looking at the deformed theory, but they're putting fluxes. And the way the parameters are <coughs> labeled as follows, so we have these integers ni, which on the one hand label just the number of brains we wrap, and on the other side are the integer quantized fluxes of the three-form field. Now you will get some four-dimensional theory with gauge group un, say broken to some factors, un1 up to unn. You will have Glorino condensation there, and the Glorino condensates as i, will have an interpretation as moduli on the right-hand side of the diagram. Now, moduli in this Calabi-Yau are obtained by integrating the holomorphic three-form basically over the three spheres. So this is the mapping. Now, under this mapping, the superpotential of the theory has a very simple form. From this duality, you derive that the effective superpotential has this form NIDF dsi minus alpha si. So what, what are df and, and s? Well, this is precisely what special geometry. So this is my Calabial manifold. I have kind of three cycles of so a cycles and b cycles, which are conjugates. And integrating the three form around the a cycles is measuring roughly the size of the three spheres. So these, as I already said, are the parameters si. And if you then integrate the same three form around the b cycle, Special geometry tells you it's a derivative of a function f, f0, and that's actually the three-level prepotential. Now, actually, this statement can be made more precise by <coughs> considering another duality, which is closely related but is different, and that's the duality of topological strings. So these are strings just living on the calabi -Yau. There's no four-dimensional space anymore, and these are the dualities that Gopal Kumar and Vafa conjectured already a long time ago. It's basically the B version of the duality that Hiroshi Aguri was telling us about uh, the other day. So here again we have the resolved calabi with the two cycles, and now we wrap so-called topological brains around it. That means two-dimensional field theories. There's no four-dimensional component anymore. And on the other side, we just have the closed string theory on this deformed geometry. And now there's a very precise mapping between the parameters. Of course, g-string and g-string are, are the same on the left and the right. But say here we have the number of brains, so the integers n i, and we can have make their individual at hoofd couplings, and we call these s i's. So the hoofd coupling on the left gets translated into the size of the cycles on the right. And it complete, com becomes completely geometrical. So the simplest kind of examples of these geometries were considered by Cacciazzo, Trilligate, and Waffe. So the singular Calabi-Yaus they studied we have the following type. Very simple algebraic equation. You start with some polynomial W of degree m plus 1. That will play the role of the superpotential. You write u squared v squared plus y squared plus derivative of w squared equals 0. Some generalization of the usual Konefold formula. Then you can resolve this object. And actually, in terms of the D5 brain, so in, the, in, the, in terms of four-dimensional gate theory, this precisely corresponds to adding this three-level superpotential. But we also have the deformed picture, and there actually, this equation, which is singular, gets smooth by just adding a polynomial f of degree n minus 1. So there's n undetermined coefficients, and these n numbers, these moduli, 
correspond to the n Clovino condensates in the gate theory. Now, these are Calabi-out free falls, but they have kind of lots of trivial factors. So in some sense, you can do a dimensional reduction. You can try to project this calabi down to kind of only the x and the y coordinates. So we're basically ignoring u and v. And you see you get some vibration that's singular along a curve. So this is the curve y squared plus w prime squared plus f. It's just the calabi where I drop the u squared and v squared. So this is the definition of a Riemann surface, or a complex curve, and somehow the image of the calabi -Yau. Furthermore, the three form in the calabi which I've written over here, which is holomorphic, becomes a one form in this xy space, so on this Riemann surface, namely y dx, which is a mirror-morphic one form. So <clears throat> that's kind of the setup in terms of the calabi -Yau. Oh, let's look at the dual theory. So I said there's this dual theory, which is this two-dimensional field theory wrapping around the two-sphere. Some kind of topological two-dimensional model. So this is the theory. It's a reduction to two dimensions of what uh, was, is called the holomorphic transcendence theory that Witten first wrote down. And its fields are the following. We have a gauge field, a holomorphic gauge field, A, two scalars, phi 0, phi 1, adjoints. One is a scalar, by the way, and the other is in one form. And the action is very simple, just kind of a linear first order term, phi 0, d bar, phi 1. So you can think of it as a beta gamma system. Plus a, super poten a, a potential W of phi. So the claim is this two-dimensional theory in the large n limits should be dual to topological strings on the calabi -Yau. So how can you see this? Well, actually it's a very trivial system. You can integrate out precisely the gauge field and phi 1. They only appear linearly. And so the model kind of only has, its only excitations are the constant modes of phi 0. So this two-dimensional system becomes actually a zero-dimensional system. Just becomes a matrix integral over this field phi, this constant n by n matrix, with action trace of W phi, where W was the superpotential in the end will play the role of the three-level superpotential gate theory. So now we have to study these, these matrix models. And the claim is this matrix model knows about the calabi -Yau. So I'll let you now show you how the calabi -Yau will come out of this matrix model, which we found very surprising. So studying these uh, matrix models at large n is a classical, there are classical techniques for them, dating basically from the 70s, and of course was used to great extent around <coughs> 89, 90, where uh, the so-called matrix models were first appearing in string theory. And the techniques, are one of the basic techniques is the following. So you take this matrix and you reduce to eigenvalues. So lambda 1 to lambda n are the eigenvalues. You integrate out the angular variables, the u, and what you get, you get a, just a, an integral over the n eigenvalues with some measure which is coming out of the Jacobian. So lambda i minus lambda j squared. Now you can exponentiate that action into the action, that measure into the action, and what you get is an effective action, which has a logarithm of lambda i minus lambda j. This is a Coulomb repulsion, as it's usually called, between the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues want not to be on top of each other, but of course it's an order g string effect. It's a one loop effect. We integrated out variables. Now, a very important role will play by this function, y of x. It's the variation of the action with respect to one eigenvalue. So you should think of putting one of these eigenvalues as a probe in the system and see what is the force exerted on that eigenvalue from all the other ones. And it's given by the, of course, the derivative of the potential. And then there is this kind of this one loop term, one over x minus lambda i. Now, the classical theory looks as follows. If g string is zero, we just have a bunch of particles, say, sitting in this potential, so they will sit at the critical points. By the way, I always work in the holomorphic context, so there's somehow no distinction between stable and unstable critical points. So we have some distribution over the eigenvalues, n1 in the first critical point, n2 in the second critical point, etc. So these are usually called filling numbers. So we have to distribute the lambdas, and here are drawn in the complex plane where they're sitting. They're sitting on top of each other in kind of so n clusters. Now, it will be useful to draw this curve. This is just a, the curve y equals w prime, uh, kind of squared. So it has two copies. And as a Riemann surface, this curves actually look like a degenerate Riemann surface. Kind of, uh, it has nodes here. So it's kind of, this is the kind of picture of this curve as a complex, as a Riemann surface. You see it has kind of singular. This genus zero with a singular. 
And so somehow you should keep this into mind. This is somehow the picture for the, the classical situation. So now what happens if you turn on the string coupling constant? So the quantum situation, and we take that Hof limit, so we send ni to infinity, and keep kind of the individual Hof couplings, g string and i fixed. That is, we keep the ratios of the eigenvalues in every critical point fixed. They all go to infinity basically in the same way. Now, there's a beautiful physics intuition what happens to the system. So these eigenvalues start to kind of condense. They form a continuum density. And because they have a Coulomb repulsion, they will not sit on top of each other, but they will spread out. And what they actually will do in general, they will form little arcs on the complex plane. What that means is that that Riemann surface we're drawing on the left, which has this kind of double points, they will split up into branch points. So there's an exact solution of this model, and the exact solution is given by this equation over here, y squared equals w prime squared plus fn. And this is, a, we recognize exactly the equation which comes to projection of this calabial. So there's a kind of a spectral curve or a, a kind of real surface associated to the large end solution of this matrix model. And if you kind of draw it kind of vertically, you get the picture of the left. And you see how we kind of resolve the picture on the left into the smooth picture on the right. So this is some familiar effect that qu quantum effects resolve singularities. So somehow these branch points, double points become branch points. And if you wish, you can kind of look at this eigenvalue distribution. I should say, say kind of the jump in Y gives the eigenvalue distribution. So if you take the same Riemann surface and slice it kind of vertically, you get precisely how the eigenvalue distribution looks like. And for instance, if you take the Coney fold, which is the Gaussian matrix model, you get a classical distribution, which is a semicircle. And that's weakness famous semicircle law, kind of the most, the first result if you Look in a book about random surfaces, random matrices. So finally, I'm claiming that in this matrix model is special geometry of Calabi-Yau's. Namely, the following thing. As I said, y of x, this one form, its jump across a cut is precisely the eigenvalue density. So if, if I integrate around a cut, I'm measuring exactly how many eigenvalues are sitting there. I mean, these branch cuts are really condensations of the eigenvalues. So the total number of eigenvalues times g-string, or this parameter si, is precisely this contour around the a-cycle. Now what about the contours of the b-cycles, which start at a cut and go to infinity? Well, remember, y was the variation of the action. So it's the force on an eigenvalue. So here we're computing what happens if you take a single eigenvalue and take it to infinity. We're looking how the action changes, which is force times kind of the length of the path. So we see the integral of y dx around b is precisely the derivative of the free energy with respect to the number of eigenvalues, because we took one out and brought it to infinity. So this matrix model knows about this Calabi-L threefold together with the holomorphic threefold. So the conclusion is roughly just doing this simple matrix model is the same thing as doing closed strings, closed topological strings on this deformed calabi -L. But now we can go back and see what is kind of the field theory application of this. So in the gauge theory, remember, we had this three-level superpotential. We break the gauge group to some factors un1 to unn. We get the Reno condensates. And actually has been checked in great detail by Cacciaso, Trilligate, and Waffa that this formula for the superpotential indeed is consistent with kind of the field theoretical computations. They started, for instance, with n equal two models, the cyber witten solution, deformed it to n equals 1, worked very hard with the, and actually derived this result, or made various checks. But we see now this, this df0 dsi being just the derivative of the, of the planar contribution of the matrix model has indeed this contribution as an infinite sum of planar diagrams. So what are we saying? So take this most simple example. So take this cubic superpotential. Take all the eigenvalues, of, take the vacuum where all the eigenvalues are sitting at zero, compute the effect of superpotential, you get this S log S piece, which is kind of universal, and then you get, for instance, a term which goes like S squared. And this coefficient is entirely given by these two planar diagrams. Just the weight of it, so some particular coefficient over here. Now, if you so, so it's completely perturbative. If you solve the critical points, 
Then as as you express alpha as the bare coupling, S becomes essentially the expectation value of a fractional instanton. So the moment you start to minimize this effect of action, you're starting to see non-perturbative effects. And W effective will be a sum over instantons. But you see, actually, it's kind of a mirage, because this is just ordinary perturbation theory. So we can say that by summing these planar diagrams, which is purely perturbative, we're solving this non-perturbative question of finding the superpotential of the n equals 1 theory. And even if you don't have an exact solution, you can work order by order in the Feynman diagrams. And if you roughly compute a diagram with n holes, it's the same as working up to n instantons, fractional instantons, in the non-perturbative definition. Furthermore, you see here that the planar expression is exact. So non-planar diagrams compute something. They compute these gravitational <laughs> couplings, but they don't compute the superpotential. It's exactly computed by the planar diagrams. And furthermore, the large n limit in these cases is precisely captured by Calabi-Yau. So kind of this planar limit in the end is kind of a master field, and this is <coughs> kind of the things that Mike Douglas was hinting at. And the Calabi-Yau threefold appears as the master field of this matrix model. So now the question, of course, is how general is this? So let's put up a, a big claim. This works for all n equals 1 theories, where you roughly can take the large n limit. So you need classical groups, vector-like representations. And you have to work in kind of these massive vacua. There might have to be some abelian groups there, but this is the general category of the work. And so what is the claim? You have this n equals 1 system. They have some three-level superpotential. And now you want to compute the effect of superpotential. You should do just the following. Restrict your fields to zero dimension, both zero dimension in space and superspace, and just compute this matrix model, where the action of the matrix model is the superpotential of the n equals 1 theory, just say at one point. Now take the large n limit of this. That computes the effect of superpotential. But in the end, of course, you don't have, it's not a large n result. You can put n equals 2. Also, the non-planar diagrams have a direct interpretation. For instance, the, the one-loop diagrams, the genus one diagrams, compute the way in which the field theory couples to R wedge R. So if you put it on a curve manifold, you get some contribution, some coefficient in front of it, which is also exact determined by summing all Feynman diagrams in this matrix model, which have genus one. So I guess this begs kind of one question. Kind of <laughs> Why does that work? And is there somehow a field theory argument that this computation could be so simple? So we're working on that. We have some preliminary ideas. So what all this seems to suggest is that somehow these superpotentials are very topological, they're indexed. There's something that is kind of completely, comp in some sense, in order to compute this, it just is enough to know the action at one space-time point. So we hope to use some kind of localization to see that indeed this integral reduces to the constant modes in the path integral. So somehow the four-dimensional quantum field theory can be reduced to zero dimensions. But then, of course, the question is why only planar diagrams? <coughs> now, whenever you can embed the theory within string theory, there's kind of a good understanding. In this work of Beschatsky, Beschatsky Sikorti, Ogure, and Waffa, and also using the Berkowitz formalism, you see, if you want to compute Feynman diagrams in the open string, you need exactly two Gluino, Gluino insertions for every hole. So every cut that you make on your Riemann surface needs two of these insertions. And so then you see that only the planar diagrams will contribute to this particular function. Now what you want to do is kind of take somehow the alpha prime to zero limit and reproduce this argument directly in field theory, some kind of stringer-like picture. So what is the evidence that this actually works? So what did we check, apart from these very simple models with just one adjoint field? So it turns, we also looked at quiver theories. So the ADE and A hat, D hat, E hat quivers. And it turns out that precisely these quiver theories, so the issue is always, is something known about the matrix model? So precisely for these quiver theories, these matrix models were looked at, and they're kind of solvable multi-matrix models, which is very rare. 
They were introduced by Kostov and the ITAP group. Basically, to, in the, the old days, to simulate strings moving on this discrete space-time, which is kind of the Dinkin diagram. And it turns out they're very nice because kind of this Jacobian you get, the zi minus zj squared, becomes something like a conformal field theory correlation function. It turns out in that case, again, there's a Riemann surface. That's some kind of multiple cover now. Not a two-folded cover, not a hyperelliptic curve, a multiple cover. And so there's again a Calabiao, which you can get by kind of simply attaching u squared and v squared there. In fact, some are very nice properties of the equipers. For instance, cyber-like dualities seem to be really completely manifest there. In some sense, it's the same universality class of the matrix model. But in fact, matrix models should, in some sense, the right matrix models should correspond to really Calabi-L threefold. So you can ask, is there anything which is more than a Riemann surface? Up to now, it's kind of cheating. So for instance, you can predict that this two matrix model will really compute to a three-dimensional geometry, which at least has kind of a really complex surface there. So it's kind of two-dimensional instead of one-dimensional. And so it will be very interesting to s what this means in terms of matrix models. Because somehow you have to have some kind of multi-eigenvalue density. Now, an example we looked at this week, actually, suggests that also the n equals 4 theory fits in this list of examples. If you look at n equals 4 and you break it down to n equals 1, you can write a superpotential, and it's actually this kind of three matrix model, phi 1, commutator, phi 2, phi 3, where you add Gaussians. Turns out you can integrate out phi 2 and phi 3, get some matrix model, that actually, this matrix model is actually solved by Kazakov, Kostov, and Nikosov. And what you find is that this matrix model has a curve associated to it, which is actually an elliptic curve. So, kind of S-duality is just here already at the level of the matrix model. And then you can go on and try to solve for the superpotential, and we try to do that. And it looks like we're getting this very non-trivial result of Dori et al. So first of all, we get SL2Z symmetry of the, of the gauge coupling, and actually we get this kind of modular form that they found for the effect of superpotential. And just to end with one last prediction, there's a deformation of this model, which is called the Lee Stressler deformation, where you replace the commutator by kind of a Q commutator. Turns out that this model also is solved as a matrix model, it's the so-called six vertex model. And it has some nice properties. For instance, this parameter beta that appears here has the symmetry beta going to beta plus tau. And plus it's kind of modular in this way. So there is still SL2Z in this model. I think that's perhaps the first example of a prediction coming from the matrix model side. So I think there are many, many things that we can do. Uh, for instance, you can apply all the double scaling limits that we applied in the 90s. Take limits where n goes to infinity, keeping g-string fixed, which we now would also perhaps call this PP wave limit. Just double, these are double scaling. It's really a theme that we are exploring. Keeping some, some other parameters small, like for instance the difference between the two at half couplings, or the difference of the two eigenvalues. And actually in that way you get geometries where there's no Ramon Ramon flux. So let me draw the conclusions. So we seem to see a very nice connection between NX1 supersymmetry and planar diagrams. Effective superpotentials seem to be able to be compute them directly using matrix models. And furthermore, these matrix models know about Calabi-L threefolds. The perturbation theory of these effective superpotentials translates into instant ensemble, so completely non-perturbative computations in the gate theory side. And many dualities, like S-duality or cyber-like dualities, are visible in kind of large N limits. So I guess there are two rather obvious open questions here. Can you apply this philosophy somewhere else? For instance, to string theory itself. And is there perhaps a new way to look at gate theories with no supersymmetry? I mean, perhaps somehow perturbation theory is not that bad. So on that note, I want to end. successfully uh, woken us up. Question over. Hello. In matrix models. Hello. In matrix
matrix models, there are uh, usually non-perturbative effects associated with the tunneling of eigenvalues from one minimum to another, which go as e to the minus n. So would you? Actually, eigenvalue tunneling, what you say, was basically kind of Steve Schenker's lesson, overall lesson about what we learned from matrix models. That's a very nice uh, correspondence in gate theory. It's precisely domain walls. And you can see the jump in the action is precisely the tension of the domain walls. So the domain walls in the gate theory are precisely these eigenvalue tunneling effects. I didn't understand the, the uh, you have a step where you have to take a large n limit, right? No. Well, yes, so, so the, these are only models that allow, in some sense, a large n limit. Right. So the representations Precisely. have to stabilize. I said vector-like representations, or tensor, no spinners, or Okay, so the representations have to stabilize at yes. large n. So yes. that, then, then my question would be, do you think that this will apply to models which have some kind of hidden n equals 2 supersymmetry? I haven't thought about it. It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, Rich Farrar, uh, Boston University. You skipped quickly over a half of a slide which referred to unitary matrix models. Yeah. Do they have some application that you know of? Yeah, so in our second paper, we looked at, so unitary matrix models roughly appear if you start to compactify. And um, yeah, I, can, I can put on the, the slides if I can find this. <laughs> So you can also look at unitary matrix models. For instance, this very simple model, which is uh, basically you have, a, so you have a periodic field. So cosine phi potential. And this is actually kind of the uh, lattice gate theory one plaquette model, the model that Gross and Bitten studied. And so it turns out that you can, out of this theory, engineer the Calabial threefold that produce n, n equals 2 cyber rhythm theory. So you have to take some double scaling limit of this model. It's actually a double scaling limit. If you see this cosine phi, since we're working in a holomorphic context, has two critical points. And it's a limit where the eigenvalues in both critical points are roughly of the same size. So it's a very different limit of the usual physical limit, where, of course, the potential is real and everything is sitting in the bottom. So, for instance, we're missing this gross width and phase transition completely. But there is a double scaling limit here. And since it's a limit where somehow the geometry becomes, you push away part of the geometry, there's no Ramon flux anymore. So that's somehow the interpretation why it would be n equals 2 supersymmetric. Okay, well, I think because we want to keep to our schedule, we should stop at that point. Let's thank Robert.